Marhaba. Right now we're going to talk about the last case ending for nouns in Arabic, which is called al-mansub. It's typically referred to in English as the accusative. So if that helps you, if you've studied other inflected languages, accusative and mansub functionally are about the same thing. On nouns, we'll see mansub marked in a couple of ways. On singular nouns, we typically see it marked with a fatha. So, al-kitab with a fatha here, pronounced al-kitab, or on an indefinite noun with fatha tanween. There's actually a wrinkle that distinguishes mansub from the other case endings that you've been learning about. When we see it at the end of a singular noun, it also gets an alif at the end. So it would not just be kitaban with a ba like this. We would add an alif as well, which means that even in a non-vocalized text, if we're reading a book, a newspaper article, etc., we will often see the alif. Even if we don't see the tanween, it'll be included in many cases because just orthographically that is the rule. It needs to be included, that alif. In regular plurals, regular masculine plurals, it instead of the un ending that we see in marfua, sort of our default, we add in. So in mansub, if I wanted to talk about the teachers, I would say al-mudarrasin, not al-mudarrasun. When we use or see mansub, it usually indicates a couple of things. Perhaps the most common is the direct object of a verb, al-mfaul bihi, as we say in Arabic. I bought a book. Well, in Arabic, a book, kitab, would need to be mansub, kitaban. Other really common places we see it are adverbs, and I'm going to talk a little more about that because the meaning is a little broader than we might think of if we're coming to this with a background in the English language. Also, the predicate, the khabar, of kana, or its sisters, kana wa akhwatiha, and the subject, the ism, of inna and akhwatiha. And there are separate videos, once again, on both of those constructions that you can go and check out for some more specific examples of how that works. When we say adverbs in Arabic, we don't just mean things that we consider adverbs in English. The, the notion of adverbiality, if you will, is a little bit broader. Typically in English, we think of an adverb that describes how a verb was done. How did you come? Quickly, slowly, or how did they drag their feet? Heavily, sadly, things like that. But in Arabic, that adverbiality, and I hate to use the word, but I guess I just did twice, uh, can also extend to answering the questions of what or when. Kaifa, ma'adha, mata. How, what, and when. So, for example, if I wanted to say I will travel tomorrow in the morning, an appropriate way to do that in Arabic would be to say سأسافر غداً صباحاً الغد is a word in Arabic that means tomorrow, and as-sabah is a word, of course, that means morning. So in Arabic, I can get away with saying, I will travel tomorrow li, morning li, sort of. I'm answering the question, when? 
not necessarily how will I travel quickly, slowly, uh, by plane, by bus, but I'm giving some information about the temporality and it's also going to be in mansub. So when we talk about adverbs, the English language word doesn't quite contain the, uh, the same number of possibilities that it does in Arabic. Let's take a look at some other examples. If I wanted to say, I bought a new book from the university bookstore. I could phrase it like this. Here, forgot some dots. Ishtaraitu, I bought. What did I buy? Mada, I bought a book. Kitaban jadidan, I bought a new book. And remember that adjectives have to agree with nouns in case. So since jadid is modifying kitab here, it is also mansub. Notice that here we have this preposition, a harf jar, and then after that we have a prepositional phrase and it's not mansub. Majrur, the majrur case, kind of overrides the mansub in this case. It's a little more powerful. So I would say, if I wanted to fully vocalize the rest of it, min maktabat til jami'a, or til jami'ati. Maktaba is majrur because of the preposition, and then al jamia is also majrur because it is the second word of the idafa. You can go watch a video on majrur to watch some more examples of that process in action. Another example, if we wanted to say, I think that the teacher is strange, I could say, أظن أن الأستاذ غريب. So here we have أن and then اسم أن وخبر أن because Al Ustad is ism anna. It's sort of the subject of the new clause or new sentence that's introduced with anna. It is mansub. And since it's definite, it will only take one fatha. Azun anna al ustadha. And then the khabar of anna will be marfu'a. Again, you can go look at the anna wa akhawatiha video for more information about that. But here is a case where al ustad would need to be mansub because it's the ism of anna, the subject that leads the new sentence or clause. One last example, if we wanted to say she was short, but she got tall, we could say it this way. That's probably how it would look in normal print. But if we wanted to give all of these i'rab their full inflections, we would say kanat qasiratan walakin asbahat tawilatan. Because qasira and tawila are both khabar for 
Kana and Asbaha, respectively. The ism of Kana and the ism of Asbaha is sort of implied. It's buried in that verb. There is an implied hiya in our conjugations of these verbs, but it's not actually present. But again, qasira wa tawila are sort of the news, the information driving the sentence. She was, what? What is it? What's the news? What are you trying to tell me? Kanat qasira then. Khabar kana mansub and khabar asbaha mansub. So again, that kind of answers the question, what? Meda. What was she? What did she become? She was short. She became 